All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming two days before Akshay. Um, I am aware that everyone probably has, well, quite a lot of you probably have other things on their mind. So, so I'm really pleased there's such a great turnout. Um, I'm Jason. I work at Valence Labs here, and I did my postdoc here at Mila. Um, and this is Danya. She's a prof here at Mila, and can tell you a lot more about causal inference. Um, uh, so yeah, we'll we'll uh, we'll follow up in a bit. Um, cool. Shall we? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is just for some, con for some context. This is a tutorial that we originally prepared for UAI. Um, that was a two hour tutorial. We've tried to, Mila has told us they're kicking us out of here at 20 past, I think, uh, 12. So we tried to chop it down to an hour ish. Keep the questions coming. It's kind of structured that the important bits are at the beginning. So if we, if we run out of time, we can just discuss more at lunch. So, um, yeah. All right, so this is a talk about what I think is kind of the future of causal um, inference. Obviously, that's a controversial statement, but um, before we can talk about the future, I think it's good to kind of start by thinking about where we kind of how we got here and take a look backwards. Um, and so at the risk of gross oversimplification, here's causality in one slide. Um, for the first kind of, for the last like 300 years, the first 250 years of causal inference history it was kind of one tool in the causal inference toolbox, and that was experimentation, right? So if you wanted to understand a world that was too complicated to kind of mathematically reason about, so if you're not Newton who's reasoning about um, gravity just by pen and paper, you have to understand the world through experimentation. So for example, James Lind in the 1700s when he was hanging out in the English Channel um, was able to show that, that uh, citrus was useful for preventing scurvy in sailors, right? And he did this by running an experiment. Um, John Snow, who's sometimes regarded as the founder of modern epidemiology, was able to show that um, cholera was caused by dirty water by removing a pump handle in Broad Street in so Soho in London. You can actually go and see that pump still today. It's kind of fun. Um, and so this kind of role of experimentation was central to causal inference, and it was formalized in the early 1900s by, by Ronald Fisher um, in his book, The Design of um, Experiments, uh, that was published in sort of early 1900s. And kind of this was the way you understood the world, right? So if you wanted to do science, you wanted to do applied science, you ran experiments, right? And the limitations of this approach to understanding the world was kind of highlighted in the 1950s with the debate around smoking and cancer, right? What wasn't controversial at the time was that smokers tended to get lung cancer and lung cancer patients tended to be smokers, right? So there was a strong correlation between smoking and cancer but someone like Fisher, who I think statistics would kind of prefer to forget if, if he wasn't such a giant in the field for many reasons, um, but uh, was vehemently opposed to, this, to applying a causal interpretation to this association. He pointed out kind of rightly that you couldn't just assume that because there was a strong correlation, that there wasn't some, say, genetic effect that was making you both more likely to become addicted to cigarettes and more likely to get cancer, right? So maybe there's some gene that sort of just makes you more have a more addictive personality. Maybe that also leads you to get cancer via some other uh, other pathway, right? Um, and so he, you know, he pointed out that the, you know we have to we have to fi find a way of, of doing this. Now, now he would have argued for doing a randomized controlled trial, but that's obviously deeply unethical in a case like this. You kind of don't want to have a you know flip a coin and say you smoking for the rest of your life and you're not. And, and we're going to see sort of who dies. That doesn't seem like the kind of thing that's going to pass any ethics board. And so, and even if, it, even if it wasn't something so horrendous as that, you know, just for practical reasons, smoking takes a really long time to, to show its effects. And so you kind of want something where you can discover these effects more quickly. Um, and so that led to all the work in causal inference from observational data. Um, so through the work of people like Yuda Pearl, who we should all know um, as a Turing Award here in computer science, and then Don Rubin in statistics, or Jamie Robinson in um, epidemiology, Guido Inmans and Josh Angrist in, in econometrics. So it's a sort of a interdisciplinary field of people working all to understand how we get causal effects from observational data. Okay. Um, and that kind of expanded this, um, this toolkit to be a pretty rich set of tools that you can use for estimating causal effects. And we can get some kind of idea of the impact of these tools by looking at economics. And why economics? Well, economics has a kind of a 
funny publishing culture if you're from CS. They all want to publish in the same top five journals. No matter what subdiscipline of economics you're in, you care about these five journals. And so you can get a kind of a good idea of what the field cares about by just reading those five journals. Um, and that's kind of what Bryce and Montesinos Ufer did in 2019, where they made these word clouds of, of the, uh, the titles of the 500 most cited articles from the AER, the Journal of Political Economy and uh, QJE, which are three of the top five journals. Um, and you can see from the 50s to the 80s, economics was a theory driven field. Might sound strange if you're not in the econ, but this was kind of how economics was done, right? You sort of assume some model of behavior and then you derive the implications. And then from the early 90s to through to today, you have this rise of evidence. And what is meant by evidence in this context is typically evidence from either observational um, causal inference or far more recently some randomized control trials. Okay, so they're sort of using the tools of causal inference to understand human behavior. Um, rather than just deriving models on pen and paper, okay? Um, and this was celebrated in 2021 uh, with the Nobel Prize that went to David Card, uh, Josh Angus, and Guido Inbens. And so sort of it's been this kind of revolution in, in economics. And if you've ever interacted with an economist, it's kind of, it's, it, it really is, it's kind of a very hard-headed field. So to have such a dramatic shift is a really big effect, right? They, they sort of tend to be, they tend to be slow moving and careful. Um, so changing the direction like this is a big deal. Okay, so causal inference transformed economics and tra transformed the other social sciences as well. Economics is just most, the most obvious. Um, and so I think it's worth asking kind of what's the next frontier for causal inference. And that's kind of what we're gonna be talking about today. But before we get to that, just a quick note on sort of, you know, why is it that applied scientists like causal inference? You know, what is it about causal inference that kind of, what does it let them do? Um, and so I think, you know, sort of the thing we have to observe is that when the systems that we study are complex, right, so we can't reason about them analytically, we sort of have to estimate the relationships between variables in our system with from data. Okay. Um, and so this is true of epidemiology, it's true of the social sciences, biology. Um, but the thing is, we don't just want to sort of make a prediction. We want to make we want to sort of estimate a relationship that some other scientists can test, right? So we so the key thing about causal effects, kind of by definition, is that if we do causal inference well, we can test we can test an estimate from one data set on an estimate from another data set. We don't have to assume that these data sets are exactly these distributions are the same, just that we're looking at the same effect. Now, you know, take Daniel's course if you want to understand this properly. There is you know, they, we could do a whole course on how you do this well, and there are obviously a lot of assumptions that need to, need to happen. But this is kind of the underlying philosophy, right? We were sort of, how do we learn testable um, hypotheses um, from uh, from data, right? Is, is, is really what causal inference is about, okay? And all of this works if your assumptions hold and, you know, you have enough data, um, but it assumes that we have access to, that the variables that play a role in the system are known, and they're mostly observed, right? So sometimes we can get away with some unobserved things, but, but generally we need to observe kind of enough variables, okay? And what we're gonna be talking about today is a setting where instead of observing the system, the variables directly, we get sort of unstructured proxies for the variables. So as an example, um, I'm working at recursion at the moment. So they collect images that look like this, uh, which are sort of images of cells under a microscope. Um, so the underlying variables that dictate the cell states are hidden from us. All we see are the pixels in an image, and we have to then try and say, well, what, what, you know, what can we do with that, right? And that's going to be the topic of today's talk. Um, one more kind of slide of motivation, you know, sort of the practical implications of this. I think I'm going to argue that, you know, like um, economics, biology involves reasoning about the equilibria of complex systems of interacting, like complex interacting systems, right? So it sort of has a similar structure to, to economics. Um, and we can observe biological systems in ever increasing detail, right? So sort of every year there are more, there are more techniques that let us sort of view the cell in different interesting ways. Um, so we can get, and we can let this data at scale in a sort of automated fashion. We get fun videos like this of robots taking photos of cells. Um, but, and we can also intervene, so we have experimental ability. So this is very nice from a causal inference perspective. But the problem is, is unlike the social sciences, we often don't 
observe the variables directly. So we're not sort of getting a nice data frame with labeled columns that each correspond to uh, correspond to a variable. Instead, we're going to get this kind of unstructured data, and we need to figure out how to do it. And so I think it's like bio is kind of ripe for 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 making a big impact if we can get these tools right. And more generally, I think thinking through like what would it take to build like an AI bench scientist is a good way of thinking this through. Um, what distinguishes this just from like a standard vision system is we need a system that can kind of see in that it maps from images to abstract variables. And we want the same kind of property that we had with causal inference, which is that these variables are kind of consistent across data sets, right? Um, so, so you know, in causal inference, I said I could I could learn a hypothesis that some other scientists could test. I want a vision system that can tell me abstract variables that some other robot would infer as well. You know, just like if you and I look through a cell, look look at a microscope, uh, sorry, look at a cell through a microscope, we kind of see the same thing. So we can talk about the same properties of the cell. I want this of a vision system, right? But importantly, I want to be able to do this from unlabeled data because kind of by definition, these systems are poorly understood. And we don't have access to sort of large amounts of, you know, image captioning from the internet. So we can't just rely on something like Clip to 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 get to get re structured representations. Although I think thinking through those, you know, the relationships between those two things are are interesting. Okay. All right. So that takes us into the realm of causal representation learning, um, which is a term coined by uh, Bernard Sholkoff and a bunch of people at Mila. So um, Rosemary, uh, Anurich, and, and Yosho, all at Mila at the time when they wrote this. Um, and, and really it's sort of a, this nice review article that sort of coined this problem. And, and although this problem has been studied in many times, it sort of made this, made these, set these problems up. Okay. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to start with a kind of detailed review of why this problem is hard in the first place, right? So what is it that goes wrong when you try and infer latent variables? What is it that limits our ability to just infer these abstract variables? Um, and then the second part is, is we're going to sort of look at a bunch of examples. This, this has been a very active area of research. There will no doubt be a whole bunch of new, of new papers submitted in two days' time to ICLEAR. Um, you know, so we're just going to give a sort of snapshot of some work that has been done. But I think we've chosen, the papers we've chosen have been chosen to kind of, because they capture commonly used techniques. And so you can kind of get an idea of what, of how people prove that these, that these things are identifiable. Um, and then we'll, we'll conclude with a set of open questions, things that, need to, that, that still need a lot of work. Okay. All right. So um, just as a setup, I've sort of alluded to this before, but just a little bit more formally, basically throughout this talk, except in the open sections, uh, uh, open question setting, we're going to be looking at uh, systems that look like this. So we're going to assume that there are a set of latent variables that describe our system, sort of that are underlying, that describe the underlying state of our system, but that we observe um, X, I'm pointing on my screen. Um, so we observe, the, you know, the set of latent variables, um, and we observe X, the image, which is kind of rendered by some generative function G that maps from, um, from the latents to the observations, right? And the question we're going to be interested in is, can we recover these latent variables Z from X? Okay. Um, does that make sense? Okay. Um, and now to kind of make this a little bit easier to think about, it'll start with like a really simple toy problem, which is like here I know the generative function G. It's just like the Pi game game engine. Um, I plug in positions for for each of these each of these balls and like maybe a, a hue. Um, and and so now I know the latent state exactly. Um, this is just a sort of simple version of the problem that we can think through. Um, and we get images like this. And I say, well, can I recover the sort of 15 or so numbers that it took to render this image? Okay. That's the question we're going to be interested in. OK. So first, I'm going to show you why we can't. And then we'll show where we can. Um, so so as so the sort of as a warm up, let's look at non-identification in autoencoders, which are kind of the canonical uh, representation learning technique. Um, so. Let's start with an image that looked like we showed before. And let's say we had the perfect encoder, right? So let's say we had exactly what we want, which is G inverse, um, and that maps from X and recovers the original Zs that we wanted, right? So this is the thing that we wanted to get. And maybe we just got exceptionally lucky and the 
random seed we picked happened to just give it to give us that right um and and then from that from that latent space uh we can map back to the image right so the latent space is just like pixel of xy coordinates for each ball and then some representation of the color um and the only constraint we're putting on this autoencoder is that it learns the identity function right so so our encoder g inverse composed with our decoder g is just the original observation okay um, now the problem is if I apply some arbitrary invertible um, transformation to this latent space, right? So this is just some arbitrary chosen invertible A. Um, and then I apply the inverse before applying the decoder. Because A inverse A is just the identity function, kind of nothing has changed with respect to my constraints. I can still reconstruct perfectly, right? Um, but now I've, now I've created a new encoder and a new decoder and it also satisfies my constraints. And so I have kind of no way to tell these two things apart based on the loss, right? Like the, the only thing I'm, I'm, I'm requiring is that I get perfect reconstruction. You give me these two encoders, well, they both look equally good, right? Um, and in fact, I've got, you know, uncountably infinite of these, right? Any, for any, any, a, any um, invertible map A will, will give me another encoder, right? Okay. Okay, so that was like, so clearly like that's too little, right? So, so just assuming, that just, just requiring reconstruction is, is not enough. So let's look at like way over on, on the other extreme. Let's say, let's just assume that that generative function G um, is, is linear. Um, and then let's further require that our latent distribution be independent as well, okay? So this is like about as extreme as we can go in terms of distributional assumptions and constraints in the generative function. Um, so then we have, we have under these assumptions, we have that our, obs oh, sorry. our observations X are just some linear transformation. So G is now just a linear map um, of the latent Z. Um, and then furthermore, we're going to require that the latent distribution be be, uh, be a independent distribution, right? Okay. Um, and so in this case, asking whether we can recover Z um, is equivalent to asking sort of the size of the solution set and anything in the solution set has to satisfy these two constraints, right? So it has to give us perfect reconstruction um, and ZI and ZJ have to be independent for all IJ pairs, right? And so, you know, if the set only contains a singleton, then we're identified, then we found, then, you know, then we can say, well, we've got the sort of a procedure that gives us the, the, the thing we want, which is a way of recovering the latents from the observations. Um, but if not, we're not identified and we have to sort of be smarter, right? Um, okay, so as an example, you know, here's sort of here's a standard Gaussian in the latent space, and then the observations will look like this. So just like some linear map applied to the standard Gaussian. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so again, let's go through exactly the same exercise we did with the autoencoder and start with um, the perfect encoder and then ask how we could transform it in order to create additional solutions, right? So, so if we had the perfect encoder, that would just be this inverse map that maps from observations. So it would just be G inverse that sort of recovers the original latent Z uh, from the observations, right? Um, and now the problem is if I apply a rotation matrix, just an orthogonal rotation matrix, um, I still, because this, these um, Gaussians are rotation invariant, I still satisfy this independence constraint, right? So these two distributions, I've now rotated this, and these two distributions are the same. Uh, so these two are equal in distribution because Gaussians are rotation invariant, right? So I've now constructed an additional solution um, that is a sort of rotated, that has a rotated latent variable, um, but I haven't violated my constraints. I can still do perfect reconstruction um, because I can just do the inverse of the rotation before reconstructing, right? Um, and you know I can do this for any rotation, and so again we have uncountably infinite solutions to this problem. Okay. So that's something kind of sad, right? So we've got like we sort of we've now gone to the other extreme. We've we've assumed as much as possible, and we're still kind of stuck, right? We still have infinitely many solutions. And notice that these solutions are problematic, right? Because they, a rotated solution implies we no longer sort of separating out the coordinates, right? So if these coordinates were like if were like position x, position y. Now my notion of position X and Y is, is like an entangled notion. So it's a sort of linear combination of the two, 
Um, okay. So yeah, I have said everything. Um, so so with Gaussian latents, we do we don't recover Z1 and Z2. Instead, we recover sort of some rotated version of Z1 and Z2 for some for some rotation matrix parameterized by theta. Um, at this point, it's sort of worth pausing and just noticing that there's some ambiguity that's clearly unavoidable in this problem, right? So so if I relabel Z1 and Z2. There's no way I'm going to be able to know which kind of which is which, right? So if I flip the coordinates of Z1 and Z2, um, that sort of seems unavoidable, and 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 that's kind of okay, right? So if I if I recover the latent variables, but I flip them, I write them down in a different order, really you've got a set, and so we're just imposing an arbitrary order, so we should, so permuting them shouldn't matter. So so we're only going to ever ask for identifiability up to a permutation, and similarly with scaling. Um, I kind of am never going to know the units of measurement you use in your data generating process. There's nothing about the observations that tells me anything about that. So it's just sort of a, a scaling factor on the latent variables is going to be something that we're also going to be okay with. And so ideally what we'd want to do is recover each latent in such a way that it only depends on one coordinate, right? So up to a permutation and scaling, right? So we're going to get sort of some, um, some estimate Z hat which is equal to some permutation matrix times some diagonal scaling of the original Z. Okay, so that's kind of what we would want and we'd be satisfied with that. All right, so now let's say, what happens if instead of using a standard Gaussian as a latent, let's use some other distribution as a latent. And in particular, what I've changed in this in this image is, is, is just changed the distribution of Z2 from Gaussian to, to being a uniform between uh, zero and three, um, and so uh, Z1 still Gaussian, Z2 is is is, is uniform. Um, so our observations now look like this, and we can sort of ask the same question: If we had this um, this this G inverse, well, we'd, we'd recover the, the latents exactly. But now, what happens if we apply different rotation matrices to this data generating process? Right. Um, now, notice if I rotate this kind of 45 degrees, I now violate the independence assumption that I had, right? These two, Z1 in this kind of rotated space, Z1 depends on Z2 or vice versa. It's just a correlation between these two. Um, and so I can kind of rule that solution out. So that solution is no longer valid under my constraints that we have to have independent latents. Um, this solution is okay because I still have independence, I've just flipped the coordinates. So this is gonna be correspond to a permutation. Um, and similarly, if I'd scaled this in, in either direction, it would be okay. Um, but you know, these rotated solutions are ruled out, right? And so uh, what Pierre Comon showed in 1994 um, in the original paper on independent components analysis was that if at most one um, of the latents is Gaussian, um, then independent components analysis is identified up to permutation and scaling. Okay, so we've sort of sneakily been looking at ICA now. Um, those are the ICA constraints that, that you know that you've got a linear map and you, you're enforcing independence of the latents. And as long as you're prepared to assume that at most one of the latents is Gaussian, you get identification up to permutation and scaling. Okay, does that make sense? Um, um, okay, so so that's nice. We've got our first identification result, but we've got it in an extremely constrained setting, right? We've, it's it's like linear independent latents. We can do something, and not Gaussian. Um, kind of what? Like, let's, how do we generalize this? Okay, so the first natural generalization that you'd want to relax is this linear mixing function assumption. That seems like the most egregious assumption if we're thinking about wanting to work with kind of real data that has sort of real complex dependencies um, from uh, from the latents. We want to relax both, but we'll start by relaxing with, um, uh, this, this linear function. So we so instead of instead of just a matrix here, G, we're going to allow for some arbitrary injective function. OK, um, and actually, as a starting point, we'll just say X and G are the same size, but let's not worry about that for now. OK, um, and so just as a sort of example of this, here I'm, I'm saying I've got one coordinate controlling color um, of this ball, and then I've got a second coordinate that's controlling X position. I'm just going to say our data generating process only has two latents because it makes things easy to visualize. Um, but yeah, we could obviously generalize that. Um, 
And what we want is some encoder that is able to recover position X and color up to some sort of okay transformations. And we'll talk about what's okay and what's not, right? But permutation and scaling would be a, an example of, of those. Um, okay, so I promise this is the last time we're gonna do this exercise, but let's do this exercise one more time, which is where we start with the first, um, uh, the, the perfect encoder, and then we look for transformations that still satisfy our constraints, right? So our perfect encoder takes these images um, and maps to a, a latent space that looks like this, which happens to be the sort of true latent space. So it places different colors along the first coordinate and it places positions along the second coordinates. Um, and I chose this latent distribution to be nice and kind of very obviously non-Gaussian to make rotations very obvious, easy to rule out. Um, so we don't need to worry about linear entanglement, right? So sort of rotations that entangle these two coordinates. We can kind of rule out very easily because any rotations are kind of obvious to spot in a distribution like this. Okay. Um, but our encoder is a nonlinear function, right? So our encoder, oh, sorry. Our encoder is a nonlinear function. Um, so we have to ask the question, well, now I'm allowed to come up with um, nonlinear transformations A, um, and can those entangle ZI and ZJ in some weird way that sort of makes them no longer just be a function of just the, the original latent variables, but, but a function of both, right? Um, and at least to me, it's not obvious, right? Um, the rotations are kind of natural, but um, you know, is, is there some arbitrary A that entangles these or not? I don't know. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to construct such an A explicitly, okay? Um, and this is from the proof of uh, Locatello et al., but it's a, an idea that, that dates back um, also in the independent components analysis literature. Um, okay, so, so I'm just going to kind of sequentially construct, um, construct this A. So the first step we're going to do is we're going to apply um, the CDF of each of the respective distributions, right? So Z1 has a distribution and Z2 has a distribution. Um, these are independent distributions. So we're just gonna coordinate wise apply their respective CDFs, right? Um, and what happens when you take a distribution, transform it with a CDF is you map to the to the zero one um, hypercube in general, square in this case, right? So that mapping takes us to the, to, to, to the unit square. Um, then I'm going to apply the inverse CDF from a standard Gaussian, right? Um, and this is just, if you've ever seen sort of a course on MCMC or on how to sample from, uh, from a Gaussian, take a uniform random variable, apply the inverse CDF and we, and we get Gaussians out, right? Um, so this is something we can always do. And so again, these are sort of two coordinate wise transformations that we've done. So at, the, at this point, we haven't entangled anything. We've just, we've just kind of done a, trans, a nonlinear transformation, um, CDF, then an inverse CDF um, on each coordinate. But now what we can do, now that now it's a standard Gaussian, now we know we can do rotations, right? So, we can, so I can rotate and I haven't changed the distribution. Um, and then I can map, do this whole process in reverse and I can map back. So I can apply now the CDF of a Gaussian to get back to the units square. And then I can apply the inverse CDF of the original distributions to get back to the distribution I had before, right? So like, this is a particularly strong result. It's not just saying I can entangle, it's like it's, I can entangle and not change the, the underlying distribution. Um, but now I've entangled these coordinates, right? So these coordinates are not independent anymore. They're, they're, I've, I've done this sort of weird transformation that I haven't changed the distribution. I still satisfy the independence constraints, but these, these, these uh, variables are now entangled. Okay, does that make sense? Um, okay, and so just to kind of say that explicitly, you know, in the original, um, in the original uh, coordinate frame um, or original basis, I had that these two variables were independent. Now I've defined this kind of complicated map that defines a new z tilde one and a new z tilde two, right? And these are a function of both variables because of that rotation matrix, right? So these two things are a function of both. Um, these have the same, these two things are equal in distribution, right? So Z tilde and Z1, uh, so Z and Z tilde have the same distribution, um, but Z1 is a, is a function of both variables and, and similarly for Z2, right? And so maybe kind of more concretely, you know, if I want to, if I wanted to say, 
uh, render an image where I just change the color without changing the position, I can't just kind of move along one coordinate. I have to move along both if I'm using Z tilde as the, as the coordinate frame, right? Um, okay. So, so these distribution assumptions can't tell which is uh, which is the correct position. That's a uh, not so easy to to uh, interpret things. So here's just like a picture of these two distributions. It's not that obvious what's what's moved to there, but if you kind of squint a little, you can see the colors are now kind of. Um, I've I've kept the coloring consistent, and there's a sort of diagonalness to to this transformation. I don't have a good way of visualizing this. I still need to work on that. Um, okay, so independence is not enough. Um, that's kind of like, that's the end of negative results. Um, we, we can now switch gears to saying, well, what is, All right? Okay. And so I guess kind of almost what should be obvious at this point is, is, is just like causal inference is kind of, uh, sorry, that causal representations can't be done without some assumptions, right? So just like you can't do causal inference without assumptions, we're not going to be able to do causal representation learning without assumptions at all. Um, and all these constructions are kind of should make that clear. Um, so instead, we're going to have to assume, we have to consider well, what can be safely assumed about the distribution that we're interested in. So the sort of the data that we're interested in, um, um, and then maybe like how can the data generating process be perturbed by interventions? That's a, that tends to be a useful thing. We'll we'll get to examples of that. And also, what can be observed? You know, what like what 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 it is about the system that can be observed. Um, and we've loosely categorized these, um, the methods that we're going to look at as being kind of you leveraging these four different ideas. You know, this is not a formal categorization. It's just sort of loose categorization. So distributional assumptions on the latents, we've already seen an example of that in the ICA world. Um, changes in distribution tend to be very useful. Um, constraints on this mixing function, we saw that in linear ICA, which is like assuming linearity. Um, and then multiple views and sparsity is also ends up being a sort of useful um, construct, which we'll look at towards the end. Um, and then kind of what we're going to be doing is, is doing something like this. Like we start with like all invertible functions then we can say, well, what fun which subset of that all invertible functions um, induce some family of latent distributions that I've assumed, for example. Um, and then maybe we'll put additional constraints on the rendering function or the generative function. And the hope is that when we apply all these constraints, what we left with is something like a unique solution. Okay. Um, and the first example of that is going to be nonlinear ICA, which uses distributional assumptions on the latent variables as well as changes in distribution. Okay. Um, <coughs> and so uh, the first result in the space came from Apo Avaranen um, and and uh, uh, Hirishi Morioka uh, from Europe's 2016. Um, and it's a small modification from the nonlinear um, ICA setting that we looked at, where we had that negative result. Um, instead of instead of assuming, um, we still have like independent latents, but now we're going to have conditionally independent latents conditioned on a time step. Okay, so we just have so we just now have multiple distributions indexed by t instead of just having one distribution. But we're going to have the same generative function for every distribution, right? So 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 the same kind of rendering function or generative function that maps from latent to observations is gonna is gonna stay constant. Okay. Um for for kind of mathematical convenience and actually to make this result go through, they're also going to assume an exponential family for for um for this latent distribution. Um and the other thing that that time contrastive learning does, but this relaxed later, um is is that this uh, this mixing function is just from RD to RD, right? So we don't we don't have sort of a small number of latents and a big number of pixels. We we're mapping from the spaces of the same size, okay? Um, and so, kind of putting this together, you can think this is like from taken from their paper. Um, we have some source signals that come from the exponential family, and they use the example of like Gaussians with modulated variances, right? So these are sort of all zero mean Gaussians. When we're in sort of time segment one, we have you know this these variances, and time segment two we have these variances, time segment three we have these variances. So each each of these uh, this over here is indexing the the which latent variable we're looking at, and then this is the observation we get. So we get just some like arbitrary nonlinear mixing of these of these things. So so we observe this right, um, and we need to recover these these source signals. 
And so algorithmically, it's kind of easy to describe what they do, um, which is they take these observed signals, they bucket it up, this, up into sort of little, some arbitrary chosen, usually equal size bins. And then they train a classifier to predict which bin you're in, right? Um, this is actually probably very familiar, like with the popularity of clip and these kinds of things, this kind of approach of like classifying yourself versus others has become very popular. Um, but so, so maybe it's intuitive, but um, yeah, so we're just predicting segment labels from observed sig signals, okay? Um, with some classifier like that. And the thing that is really surprising that they showed um, is that this the final hidden layer representation is equivalent up to an element-wise function and a rotation, but we can get rid of that with ICA, um, um, to the original segment, uh, to the original segments. Okay. Um, and we're going to show why. Um, that, at least to me, is not obvious at all. Um, so if you, yeah, if you haven't seen this before, it's actually kind of a fun exercise to think about why this might, might be the case. Um, okay, so assuming that the classifier is a universal approximator um, and um, the, the, the optimal features, um, sorry, the optimal features for your sort of final hidden layer is a linear function of this, this representation, right? So, so sort of if you have um, universal approximation, then, then this is just the final hidden layer of, of, of a neural network. So it's, um, a, take, we're taking the log so we can get rid of the, the, the activation. Um, and, and this, just from standard um, results on, on multinomial classification, you have to deal with the fact that, that there's a scale indeterminacy. So you have to divide by one of the classes. Um, so we're just going to arbitrarily choose the first class, divide through all of our our sort of x of logits um, activations, um, and then you get a sort of unique solution, which is so you get the density ratios between class one and class t right. Right. This is just a standard result from from what softmax optimizes basically. If you have unbounded capacity, right. So um, so log of the the output is going to be the log difference um in in conditional densities um by bayes rule you can flip this round into talking about um p of x given given the class rather than the other way around right so so this is just Bayes rule directly um you'll notice that if we have a px in both of these that gets we can get rid of that and so we can rewrite this as as the log difference in the conditional density of the observations given the label. Um, so the difference between these two things, plus this this um, difference in marginal for the for the labels. And if we've chosen e equal size bins, these marge these this is just going to be equal to zero because they're the same they have the same marginal distribution, right? So you can just kind of forget about this term on the end, um, and we just have this log difference in in, in conditional densities. Okay, okay. So this is what our classifier is going to give us, and then on the other side. Um, uh, the exponential family assumptions says that the conditional density of the um, of the latent variables um, has this form, right? So this is just from the definition of an exponential family. Um, it's just a sum of the parameters in the uh, sufficient statistics, right? So so this is just comes from from the exponential family. Um, now, one thing that's a little bit annoying is this is this is talking about the density of um, of the latents. Um, not the density of the observations, right? And we've just derived an expression for the density of the observations. Um, so we want to have some way of relating the conditional density of the observations to the conditional density of, of the latents. Um, now, if you're very familiar with the uh, change of variable formula, if you work on normalizing flows, this is going to be the most boring next two slides. But if you're not, um, and you've forgotten your calculus, hopefully it'll be useful. Um, so what does the change of variable formula say? Um, it says, if we have, if we know that a random variable x is some function g of a random variable z, um, we can ask, well, what is the density of, of how does this density of z relate to the density of x, right? Um, and the change of variable formula says, well, look, you can map back, take the inverse of g, and apply to get the density of x, or we can apply, we can do the sort of inverse map and evaluate the density of Z, but then we have to do a rescaling to, to deal with the fact that, that, 
that this now this density has to still normalize to, to integrate to one, right? So we have this sort of annoying scaling factor um, that ensures that that the normalization is 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 still one. Okay, and sort of in pictures, um, let's say we've got you know some uh, uniform distribution, so beta one one on um, on the latents. Our G function is just going to be um, a quadratic. Then the forward map just looks like you know sample from Z, apply G, get out a distribution um, on X. Um, and and so when we're asking what is the probability that X is in is in this range, well we can say well if I sort of apply the inverse map, I can say well what, uh, how much mass from Z lands in this bucket basically. That's what that's essentially what you're doing with the um, with the, the uh, with the change variable formula, and we can ask for this for any for any particular x. Um, and one thing that's sort of useful for us is if we change the distribution of z, that obviously has observable implications for x. This is particularly useful because we're going to keep g constant across different distributions um, and change the distribution of, of of z. Right. So so the thing that we're sort of we're sort of fixing a G function, a G mapping, and then changing the distribution of latents. And so that's sort of, and that has obviously observable implications. Um, like I said, um, and in practice, we're gonna see samples of X, so we can estimate this conditional density of X. Um, and then we can we can use that to back out sort of, at least if we knew G, we could use that to back, to back out the distribution of, um, of, of, of Z. Um, by maximum likelihood, I don't need to go into that. Okay, so applying the change of variable formula, we can sort of, we can then get an expression for P of X given uh, given the uh, this conditional density, right? So so this is literally just the change of variable formula from before. Um, this is the conditional density of X given, uh, given a label. This is what the change of variable formula says it should be. Um, now we have an expression for this. That was what we derived two slides back uh, from the classifier. Um, and our expression for this looks like just this linear map of, of, of the hidden states plus a term that depends on, plus the sort of uh, first class. And we can get an expression for that first class. It's a little bit of algebra. I'm going to skip that. But just there is an extra term there. Um, and then Plugging in the distributional assumptions, we can get an expression for this as well, right? So on the previous slide, uh, we also had from the exponential family, we had this expression over here for um, for uh, for the latent variables, right? And so now we have sort of equality between these two things, and basically at this point, it's a bunch of slightly annoying algebra to show um, that this hidden state is just a linear function of of these um, of these sufficient statistics. Right, um, <coughs> and so that then tells you that you're linearly identified, right? So, so once you do the algebra, you see that your your hidden state is linearly related to the source signals that we cared about, um, and then you can do ICA to deal with that linear. Now you've got sort of a you've got two representations that are equivalent up to a linear transformation, and ICA told us how to rotate and find because um, these these things are independent. We can rotate and find the, the right the right coordinate system. Okay, I'll pause there because that was the most mathematically intense part of this whole talk, I think. Um, did that make sense? Yep. Oh, so if you don't have... Great, okay, so 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 the question for those online was was like, what happens if we don't have this T conditioning variable, like the split in time? Um, so you can generalize that on the next slide uh, to to conditioning on some environment variable uh, that changes that also changes the distribution. So this is this was one, like one of the main observations in the subsequent follow up work was like I just need something that is going to shift my latent. I need something that I can condition on that shifts my latents around. It doesn't have to be time, uh, but it, it, I do need to be able to, like have these sort of non stationarity. Um, and I just need enough of it that it pins down the latent variable. So something I haven't talked about, which I probably should have, actually, I think it was on the previous slide, is, is the sufficient variability assumption is basically saying we kind of have enough variation that we cover, that we shift around all, um, all the latent variables and not just a subset of them. So we have kind of full rank condition. Um, um, so 
So there's sort of two generalizations that you, you'd have is actually there's three if we include the environment variable thing. Um, the one is, is what about if we have noise in the input? So this was a deterministic map previously. We might have some noise in the, in the output. Um, and then secondly, the dimensionality of the latents and the observations don't necessarily have to be the same, right? And so that, that's um, probably the best known work in the space uh, is IVAE, um, which um, which sort of ge did these generalizations, right? So so it has the same conditional factorization as time contrasted learning. So, so again, but now we're conditioning on an environment variable. So you've got sort of data from multiple environments and you're kind of free to choose what the environments are. That makes sense. That gives you this conditional independence. Now, so that's, you know, that there's an art to that, right? Finding environments, finding multiple environments give you conditional independence. Um, latency is not obvious, but that's what you need to do um, if you want to apply IPA. Um, and um, and then we can get rid of the this noise in the input. There's this trick that you can use uh, do with uh, with a Fourier transform if the, if the sort of scale of the noise is known. We can speak to Seb, who's probably some I don't know if he's in the audience. Um, he's got a nice way of getting rid of that in his papers. Um, <clears throat> um, and the new idea in IVAE was, was so time contrastive learning actually used, I think mainly just because they were sort of excited about the fact that they had the first results at all. They just used exponential families with one uh, sufficient statistic. So it was like Gaussians where you're just shifting around either the mean or the standard deviation. Um, in IVAE, they make this observation that if you have, if you have multiple sufficient statistics, um, then you get permutation scaling out of that. Right? And so there's a, there's a sort of new idea around that. Um, that I believe is where we're pausing. Um, so we're gonna take a, we have half an hour left. So let's take like maybe a four minute break um, <laughs> while we swap over. And then, and then I, I took a bit long, but, um, and then Daniel's gonna take the, the, the rest. While we're kind of just getting settled back in, let me just remind us all of where we left off and um, summarize maybe the, the, the strategy for getting identification results in causal representation learning that we've just seen. And it's perhaps the seminal strategy in the space, right? And the idea was, uh, on one hand, we used the idea of the exponential family to get some system in which the latent variables that we actually care about, right, the Z of that would produce any given image or something, we found a system in which we can make it linear in something. And, and what we did was we used the exponential family assumptions to do that. And moreover, we've seen uh, you know other strategies that use either distributional assumptions and the latents like independence of all of the components or constraints on the mixing function itself, like linearity, to try to pin down the correct representation, right? The correct basis frame, rather. Good. So, so now what I'm going to talk about, and I'll do this for a variety of other different strategies, but there's going to be a core idea that shows up in all of these, and it's around sparsity. Okay. So instead of kind of making linear things linear, our new strategy is going to be introduce some other parameters uh, so that they are sparse with respect to the true representation. Okay. And then we're going to try to use sparsity as a penalty to try to pin down the correct representation as opposed to incorrect solutions. So to motivate this, uh, I'm going to start by settings that use multiple tasks or multiple labels to get that new set of parameters with which we can apply some sparsity. So to motivate this, let's consider an example where we have a gene expression. And now we're not going to consider latents that cause the gene expression. We're going to think about all of these latent variables that might mediate some disease phenotype of interest given gene expression measurements, right? So maybe we can think of uh, proteins as being these candidate latent variables in this context. Sorry for that. Um, and now we're going to ask, how might we construct a representation that recovers these latent variables, these protein levels, which we can't measure, um, up to some benign transformations, right? So just like sort of Jason did before, we can put on our deep learning hat, right? And we can say, well, uh, what I might do is learn 
a feature extractor. So I can fit whatever fancy neural network I want as a feature extractor. And then on top of that, I will learn a linear map to predict my outcome of interest, my disease phenotype. And then I'll take the second to last layer of this neural network and treat that as my latent variables. My, my feature extractor will try to think of as our latent variables. So our question is going to be, um, is that enough? Does this constraint suffice? So in the spirit of model correct model specification, we're just going to assume that the true model really is linear, right? So we have some phenotype or some outcome of interest that really is a linear function of the latent protein levels. So it's true that the feature extractor, which recovers the true Zs and the true linear mapping, they minimize prediction error. Right? So among all solutions that minimize predict prediction error, our correct solution is part of the minima. But we can construct many other solutions that also equally minimize prediction error, but which are not the correct solution. So as we were kind of seeing before, we can apply a rotation to the correct latent variables, and our linear map can just learn to undo those rotations. And now, again, we've constructed another solution that satisfies our constraint, but gives us a different coordinate system in which our latent variables no longer mean what they meant in the first system. So now we're going to try to use a different learning signal, but which is really inspired by this idea of having data from multiple environments, right? So Jason talked about in IVAE how they used multiple environments to get that conditional factorial prior that we want on the latent variables. Now we're going to use multiple different outcomes, okay? So we're gonna assume that we have this kind of model where in each environment, the outcome variable of interest, its relationship with the protein levels or, or the latents changes slightly, okay? So in each environment, we have a different linear mapping from Z to Y, and we can think of these as being W sub, okay? So the mechanisms are changing, and we're going to put constraints on how they change, and this will give rise to some interesting identification results once we appro use appropriate other constraints. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume that these environments are going to be related to each other in a very specific way. And I'm going to go through this quite slowly. Um, so they're going to be related via tree. And this is how. So if I want to think about the linear coefficients W1 for environment one, the assumption that we make is that these coefficients are transformed based on the root nodes causal mechanism by adding this linear offset. So another way to think about this is like to give a concrete example, maybe these environments represent different species from which you can gather some dis disease phenotype. In each species, the disease phenotype, how it relates to the latent variables mutates, it changes ever so slightly. But it changes in this very specific way where you look at your parent environment and you change based on a linear offset. So to give one more example, if I were to consider one of the leaf nodes, right? Environment number three. Now we're, we're gonna go from the root node and now we get to add two linear offsets in order to mutate our mechanism going from the root to environment number three. Now the core assumption in all of this is we're going to assume that these linear offsets, this mechanism by which the, 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 the offset by which the mechanism evolves, rather, is sparse, okay? And in particular, it's one sparse. And the, the way to think about this, just in sort of plain English terms, is that we imagine that going from species zero to species one, let's say, the behavior, the effect of a single protein changes, while every other coefficient that relates proteins and phenotypes stays exactly the same, okay? So we allow for the mechanism to change, but in a very sparse way between parent-child environments. 
So to summarize the, the parameters of the model now, we need to learn, of course, the root coefficients, the, the originator, the progenitor coefficients. And we also have to learn all of these linear offsets, which we can collect together into a matrix that we call delta um, that correspond to the offsets along all of the arcs of this tree. Okay. So given that this is the, the model, what are we going to do and how are we going to get an identification? So now what we're going to do is we are going to simply minimize prediction error as we were doing before. So what I've written is just the sum of empirical risks in each environment. But now we also apply an L0 penalty to that matrix delta, which contained all of the sparse offsets, telling us how the mechanism evolves across environments. So why does the L0 penalty help? So to kind of give a picture, I want to kind of remind us that the feature extractor that we learn, we are at risk of learning, instead of the true solution, some rotation of that true solution, right? Now, if we learn such a solution, let's just consider for ease an environment and its risk, an environment that is just a single step away from the root, right? So for that, this is the optimal uh, prediction coefficients, right? So for an E that is just one step away from the root, this is the correct model. In order for the rotated solution to still be able to learn this correct model, we have to unrotate the solution, right? We have to apply first this matrix A inverse. But notice that one of the terms that we have is going to be this delta times A inverse. Delta is supposed to be a sparse um, vector, but A inverse is going to be dense, right? And so the trick here is to realize that because we're applying a penalty that asks for our deltas to all be as sparse as possible, after we have, you know, we unrotate the solution, the wrong solution, it's not the deltas that we end up getting are unlikely to achieve a less sparse solution than the original uh, correct representation. Okay, and this is this is the trick that we're going to play, and um, we can, with some other assumptions, show more formally that indeed the solutions when you minimize these kinds of sparsity penalties, the solutions that the model recovers are generally going to. Uh, recover the true latents up to permutation and scaling. Okay. So now, now that we have this like idea in our heads that we've paged in now, should be that we're going to try to find some other parameter that is sparse in the true representation. We can take this idea uh, to, for example, multiple tasks. So instead of having you know the same disease phenotype but measured across different environments, we can have different outcomes of interest. And so uh, in a very recent paper, um, this idea was extended to consider the situation where you have multiple different tasks, each with a sparse relationship to the underlying latent variables. So you, the way to think about this is that you have a bunch of different oops, sorry, labels, and each label is going to depend only a, on a ideally small subset of the latent factors, okay? That is to say that these, you know, per task coefficients are sparse. And we're gonna play exactly the same trick where the alternate solutions, all these rotated representations, they can only solve this task with minimal prediction error if they learn to undo the rotation that was applied but in general, this new matrix, these new linear coefficients are not going to be as sparse as the, as the true coefficients. Okay? So that's, that's one of the tricks that we can leverage when we have access to either multiple views or multiple tasks, and we're willing to assume this sparse relationship between latent variables and tasks or sparse relationships between how mechanisms evolve across environments.
Okay. So I want to kind of encourage you to keep this idea of sparsity and how it's going to be useful in mind. We'll come back to it again and again and again. But for now, I want to dive a bit deeper into this idea that we can use mechanisms and temporal data in order to constrain uh, representations. And we can place assumptions on how our data generating process evolves over time. Okay. So now we're going to assume sort of a hidden Markov model, right? Where our latent state evolves over time according to some transition function. For the rest of this talk, this transition function I'm gonna we're gonna call mechanisms. And at each time point, we're going to have this emission matrix, right? Or or a generative fun function that renders our observations given a set of latent parameters, latent configurations. So again, G, which is our generative function, stays the same across time, but the the state of the latent variables evolves across time. And what we would like to do is, of course, um, learn how to, given an observation, map back and infer the set, the latent vector that produced that observation. I already said this, but just to kind of make this precise again, we're going to assume that um, the generative function stays the same across time. And we're going to see how assumptions about the mechanisms are an alternative way to get identification results. So one of the um, perhaps early papers in this, this that exploited this idea and developed this idea uh, considers sparse mechanisms, right? So here's a little situation where you have a very simple, you know, three object system where you have a robot, a ball, and a tree. Uh, and at time point t minus one, the robot perhaps chose to kick the ball. And in the next time point, the ball's position has moved. But of course, it's obstructed in its path by the tree. So we can think of maybe the latent variables of the system as being the tree's position, the ball's position, and the robot's position. Just keeping things very simple. And we consider the transition function Right, And we consider how past latent states affect the future latent states. And we may also allow ourselves to observe and then consider these action variables, which uh, allow us to capture how other agents may inter interact with or um, intervene on the system. And the key thing that we're going to assume here is that the relationships between past and future are going to be sparse. Okay, so. Indeed, what we see in this graph representation of this mechanism or this, this transition function is that not every single variable at the previous time point affects every single variable at the next time. And we're going to play a very similar trick to what we saw with IVAE, where we're going to use the variables from the previous states as conditioning variables. And we're going to assume conditional independence at a given time point to be able to exploit the same kinds of tricks with the conditionally factorial exponential family prior that we were able to use for IVAE. And now this idea that uh, the true solution allows you to construct a sparse transition function, but uh, alternate solutions may not, right? that gives rise to identifiability results. With some additional assumptions and caveats, of course. So, in particular, um, you know, for this particular result, we have to assume that two, roughly speaking, two variables don't share exactly the same causes from the previous time point and exactly the same effects. Like we we don't want to have too much symmetry between the variables. But once we make that assumption, then the sparsity gives rise to one more constraint that helps us pick the correct solution as opposed to a uh, arbitrarily rotated solution. Okay, so this idea of, of how mechanisms constrain this equivalence class of solutions that we are able to learn using representation learning uh, criteria 
This was formalized by, in fact, uh, Jason and co-authors uh, a few years ago. And the idea here is that, um, as we've already seen, we have an encoder that encodes to the latent state at time t. And we have mechanisms that change the state of the latent variable. In this case, we just have these offsets, right? And we decode at the next time point. And in addition to the reconstruction, identi the identity constraint we've seen before, we can ask for this kind of temporal reconstruction, right? We can say that we want to learn a model that allows us to apply the mechanism to the encoded latent space and then decode and be able to reconstruct the observation at the next time point. And now what we're going to do is we just we're just going to assume that the mechanism is known, right? Um, there's a lot of results in this really nice paper for unknown mechanisms or hypothesis class of mechanisms. But if we assume that the mechanism is known, then we're going to ask if we can play the same game of applying some invertible transformation to the latent space. So warping the latent space, changing the representation and uh, asking under what conditions can we learn alternative solutions by applying its inverse? And what this paper shows is that we can characterize this all these alternative solutions that create the non-identifiability in the first place by considering what kinds of equivariances do these mechanisms have, right? Another way to say this is, what are these transformations that we can apply that commute with the mechanism as well? And, you know, intuitively, this will end up capturing a lot of the mechanisms, the, the, the sort of um, transformations that Jason talked about, like changing of units and permutations. These are typically transformations that commute with a lot of mechanisms. But this gives a nice characterization that our non-identifiability set, I'm so sorry, this is like totally in my face. Um, and apparently I'm a very like articulate person. Um, our set of solutions, right? Our non-identifiability is characterized in this particular setup by all of the equivariances of our mechanism. So that seems really nice, um, but we can sort of ask, right? For a lot of, you know, interesting mechanisms, what are the equivariances? This is a nice characterization, but it would be nice to have kind of concrete examples of the kinds of results that we can get. So um, one thing that they show is they consider the case of affine mechanisms. So this is, you know, we assume that the latent st state is, is transformed by some linear transformation in an offset. And, you know, the, the sort of interesting result, the cool result here is to show that if you constrain yourself to affine mechanisms, then you get the exact type of linear identifiability that we got in the time contrastive learning setting, right? Where our uh, latent representation will be identified up to some linear transformation, um, so long as we satisfy some sufficient variability constraints. So in this case, we need to see uh, d plus one different offsets. So it's not so surprising. And the reason we, we wanted to kind of highlight this particular result is it reinforces the lesson that we already saw earlier of the strategy of, you know, make the latent variables, the true solution that you want, linear in something. And therefore, by imposing those constraints, we'll actually be able to get a feature extractor, right, or, or latent representation that also will be linear with respect to the true solution. So this is not so surprising, but it's a it's a nice um, way to see the same result in two different ways. Um, indeed, this is again this sort of follows the make linear things linear strategy. Okay, we talked about mechanism and mechanisms and changes over time, and I want to build on that idea by talking about paired samples, right? Using the idea of mechanisms and changes to get sort of many different views of the same observation 
under different perturbations of the system. And we're back to kind of exploiting sparsity. So I want to want you to kind of get back in your mind this idea that we're going to find some parameter in which the true representation will achieve some notion of sparsity and all incorrect solutions will not. Okay, so in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to assume that we have some agency to intervene on the latents in a sparse way. Okay, so like this, you know, you have this controller here and we're imagining what the controller is going to do is you're going to manipulate some state of the system. And these manipulations are going to be ideally very, very sparse. You'll change a single latent variable. This does not mean that in observation space that the, the changes are going to be sparse. They may be dense in pixel space, for example, but they'll be sparse in latent space. And we're going to get a series of sort of counterfactual samples almost for the same image, we're going to get many different views of that image, for example, under different perturbations that are sparse. So to kind of tie this all together with an example you've already seen, uh, we'll go back to the latent space where we have, you know, just two simple latent uh, variables, one that encodes for the X position of the ball and one that encodes for its color. So what sparse perturbations mean are that we're going to get a new image in which I've changed just a single axis in the latent space, right? So here I have changed the ball's color. In the next image, I may change just the ball's position. And now, you know, I'll kind of articulate or, or illustrate why sparsity. And it's for the, the same reason we sort of saw before. So now let's consider a rotated axis. So you, you notice I relabeled the axes as just Z1 hat and, well, apparently I did Z2 hat and Z2 hat uh, as a typo. But the reason for this is to kind of articulate this point that Jason showed us earlier, that in our rotated space, these coordinates don't mean the same thing anymore as position and color, right? They're, they mean something quite different. Now, for the same points, in order to represent the, these changes that I showed you earlier, we're going to need to move in two axes, in two dimensions. Okay? So there's no way anymore to represent those images using the change to a single latent axis. Now I'm going to have to use these dense changes in order to represent uh, my evolving images. Right. So now, if I add this extra constraint now, when I learn representations to say that I want to model you know, a picture and then the picture after transformation was applied using the sparsest possible change, it's sort of not surprising that you end up recovering uh, the true representation up to permutations and scaling uh, under some extra assumptions about sort of having sufficient variability. So by now, like, you, you see there's like a, a mantra that keeps repeating, right? There's always, okay, under some assumption of sufficient variability, but you know, you see add one more constraint and you get permutation and scaling identifiability. And the other sort of maybe then intuitive but really exciting result is that indeed, then we can ask ourselves, okay, well, what if the ground truth changes weren't one sparse? What if they're two sparse or more generally case sparse? Then what we what we know is that in some sense then, right, there can be some sort of incorrect solutions that can still represent two sparse changes. So of course you're not gonna get now uh, permutation identifiability, but you may get identifiability up to blocks, okay? So you're not gonna be able to rotate or entangle all of the coordinates, but you may have blocks in which you can entangle the coordinates. Okay, so I think we're gonna run out of time. So let me try to just maybe get through one of the last strategies really quickly. And this will be about not paired samples, but rather, again, multiple distributions under which that are that are generated by doing interventions on the system, okay? So keep in mind, we're not gonna get like an image and then the image after a change, but we'll get now data from many different distributions that are unpaired but each distribution comes by doing an intervention on some lane. And 
this this idea, um, the first result is maybe is is sort of very intuitive, right? If we know that each distribution is identified or indexed by a hard intervention, and a hard intervention means that we have taken a latent value and set it to a constant, right? This is like saying I'm only going to get data sets where, or I'm only going to get images where the uh, object is in position little x. Okay? So you'll get a whole bunch of images, but there's a fixed latent value along one of the axes. Of course, like in that scenario, it's not surprising that actually you can pin down the latent um, optipermutation so long as you're able to observe interventions on every single latent, because these hard interventions tell you how to fix your latent space such that you kind of know what one of the dimensions means. Maybe the exciting part of this, this um, result in this paper is that they also show what to do when you can do hard interventions. When you have changes, but these changes may make multiple latent variables change at the same time. In that case, they exploit a different type of signature that distinguishes between a correct solution and a rotated solution. And there's, I should say, there's caveats. There's, there's some other assumptions that make it so that we can only, we only have to worry about rotations, but um, we'll focus on, we'll not focus on that so much. And this, this trick that they use is called independence of support. Okay, so I just want to quickly say what this is. Independence of support is kind of a cool new idea that's not independence of latents. Okay, we're we're looking for these the support of these two different latent variables to be independent, right? So we sort of want the support to look like a nice box. And notice, like you can have a non-independent distribution and still get independence of support. And that's the key thing here. The idea, of, like, why does this help? And that once we see this nice box, it's maybe pretty intuitive. Like you can't rotate boxes without you know seeing seeing a, a change in signature, and in this case, you can't rotate without losing this independence of support. Okay, so I think what I'm going to do is skip one of the last strategies, which is around sparse decoding, which puts more constraints on the mixing function, but puts you know no constraints on the distribution of the latents and does not require data from multiple distributions. Um, you can read more about this in our paper uh, on deep generative models via sparse decoding. And what I'm going to do is just kind of uh, skip ahead to the last slide. What did I do, Jason? <laughs> okay. All right, perfect. Good. So let's kind of just conclude here. We, of course, we skipped some of the open questions that we had had written down that would kind of prompt some thinking on, on this question of like, have we done enough to build an AI scientist? Even, even though we have all these strategies in our toolbox, just like we had, you know, tools in our causal inference toolbox, uh, we now have tools in our causal representation learning toolbox, but do we have everything to build an AI scientist? And, you know, I think, you know, Jason and I sort of take the view that we don't. Uh, there's many, many types of unobservable uh, quantities that we believe we don't yet know how to mathematically kind of invert from the observed data that we get. But what I'd like to kind of, you know, end on just to summarize this whole talk is like, I mean, Jason made the slide and I think he puts it really well. Like this question of representation learning really is about choosing the right coordinate system, right? Like it's a question of you know, you get to, from your observables, come up with some coordinate system that tells you, okay, each point in your observations can be generated by points in this coordinate system, but it's it's interpreting what the axis of the system mean that's sort of the trick in causal representation learning, right? Sometimes, you know, we'll only get certain kinds of causal effects or the ability to learn certain kinds of causal graphs only in the right coordinate system and, and not in some others. So in this case, like, you know, I think on the right-hand side, that is the 
earth centric view of the solar system, which you can, you can write down, you can totally like explain our observations that way, but you end up with a coordinate system that's very complicated, right? And it, it really will change all of the downstream observable implications thereafter. So I'd like to kind of just leave you with that thought and, and kind of also say that like maybe at a very large scale, what we're sort of interested in, and I think where this field uh, will progress and needs to go is understanding how to evaluate learned representations, how to trade off and consider different coordinate systems and understand what the different implications are, testable implications are of, of these different choices. Um, so I'll end there and say thank you very much for patiently listening, um, even though we're so close to iClear. Good luck with your submissions if you have them. And uh, I'll advertise just you know, in the winter, I'll be teaching a course on causal inference and machine learning, and this stuff will be in there at great lengths. And so you can like learn much, much more about it then. Okay, awesome. Thank you, everyone.